The Seam Nicholas Taleb does not need much of an introduction. I'm sure everyone in this room has read The Black Swan. If you haven't read Skin in the Game, you need to get your copy and read it right away. You won't be able to put it down. If you've not seen uh, Mr. Taleb on the Liberty Report, we've had him on twice, I think, and it's been a <laughs> delight. I watch it over and over again, and we all laugh and enjoy it. I think one of the greatest thinkers of our time, I didn't know until yesterday, I'm ashamed to say, or I hadn't remembered, also professor of engineering at New York University, but one of the exciting and most original thinkers of our time, Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Yes, I prefer to sit, uh, to speak while sitting uh, down. Uh, one, because it relaxes me, but, but mostly because it relaxes the audience. As an empiricist, I tested it and discovered that it becomes more of a conversation. If you have a conversation with a waiter in a restaurant, you're stressed out. If the person sitting across from you, it's easier. So uh, my history, uh, I was a trader for uh, a lot of, as you can see, beard, a lot of years. And then I retired from trading and didn't know what to do with my life. And I was very poor at chess and tennis. And, you know, I lose concentration in both, you know, start daydreaming. So I decided to become a professor. Okay, so, uh, and then, <laughs> given that I get bored with usually topics, I figured out mathematics is the one the easiest because, you, you know, you can you don't fall asleep. So, and books are short and, and the concentration is brief and so on. So out of laziness. So I started working on systems, how they can handle disorder. Okay. And so I was a trader. I was sort of prepared with probability. So I worked in that field. So, and I embarked on a project called Inserto. Uh, Latin for uncertainty, uh, five, five volume, and Skin in the Game is the last volume dedicated to you know whom, right? Our friend here, whom I called a Greek among Romans. Uh, sorry, a, a Ro sorry, I apologize. A Roman among Greeks. Why a Roman among Greeks? Because Greeks like theory, Romans despised theory. They wanted practice, and they wanted a system that was designed, flexible enough. Look at the bridges they built without theory. They're still standing. <laughs> okay. The laws they had were flexible. It was, and they had, in fact, a, 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 the common law was already built into the system they did business. They did everything like in engineering. Nothing should be final and it's always meant to be improved. And also, somehow, the Roman understood something I call scaling, about which later which in fact tells you that the property of a system, like you could be a libertarian at a state level and a communist at the commune level, and it's not incompatible because an elephant and a mouse don't have the same properties. And you can see the difference between political system resides vastly more in the scale. Singapore versus China, they have this exactly the same population, almost the same population, the same culture, and the same uh, political system, <laughs> okay, but it works in sort of happened to work in Singapore better than Mao Zedong's China, all right. So that's what I call scaling. What works in Norway, okay, with the size of I don't know the size of uh, borough New York of New York, okay. So th what works in Norway doesn't work in a three hundred million, you know, uh, in a country three hundred million <laughs> people. Okay? And what works in Canada cannot work in the United States. There's a scaling difference. So, so this is sort of what I work on, uh, how properties of disorder and stuff like that. And of course, we're going to talk about now interventionistas, okay? because this is, I have a war with interventionistas. I'm Christian Lebanese, and I'm here because of, and I mean, I had to you know, witness civil war because of a certain class of people uh, that I'll discuss. But let me link it to trading to make it practical. Before we talk about interventionistas, it's the same problem. Let me talk about trading. There's something I <laughs> dubbed the Bob Rubin trade, and I heard earlier, and uh, not, not without a reason, because a lot of people have perpetrated it, but he was too close to government. And it's as follows. You make a bonus as vice chairman of Citibank for, 20 year, for 12 years, sorry, or 10 years. He made $124 million in compensation. 
you know, based on policies <laughs> benefiting from the system. Now, of course, I don't know if you remember, but exactly 10 years ago, there was there were some headlines, okay? Now, what, uh, what happened? Citibank was insolvent. The taxpayer, or, and of course, Federal Reserve and Hidden Ways, rescued it. $5.3 trillion of banking losses, more than they ever made in history. Who put the bill? Did he show up with a negative paycheck? So I said, okay, I'm going to write back my, my compensation. No. Who paid for it? Bus drivers, uh, Spanish grammar instructors, uh, specialists, sorry, Spanish grammar. So uh, one of the characters keep propping up in my book. Uh, yoga instructors who pay taxes. All these people were chipping in to cover for him. Now, this is what I call the Bob Rubin trade. The Bob Rubin trade is when you transfer the downside to other and keep the upside. <laughs> that Bob Rubin trade cannot be remedied by regulation. How do we know that? 3,755 years ago, okay, Hammurabi, Hammurabi in Babylon, okay, that was before it was invaded by, by you know, by George Bush and stuff. It was, it was Babylon and that they had. And it, it, they had, for those who could read, it was written, actually for some reason, I go on pilgrimage and and skill in the game means you have to have an emotional thing. So if you're reciting it, you've got to recite it in the original language. Or, but so I go on pilgrim, and it's in Paris, you know, where you see a lot of Korean tourists. Nobody but Koreans show up. Maybe it's not tourist guides elsewhere. Come on pilgrimage to that place where it's explained that if the architect builds a house and the house collapses, okay, the architect shall be put to death. So in other words, you cannot hide risks and walk away from them. You have to own your risk. And that was the beginning of civilization. But the eye for eye isn't a symmetry argument. It was initially the Hammurabi argument. So he who shall benefit from something should own the risk. That was Hammurabi's law. You can't walk away from it. And the Romans, of course, had, had a version of Hammurabi's law. Uh, uh, practically, every civilization had it until this generation. Okay, so we started seeing people making, uh, having benefits from the system without bearing the risk. And uh, let me explain. Uh, you've heard of uh, think tanks. Okay, you've heard of warmongers. Okay, of course, Thomas Friedman. I accuse him by name. Okay, it's kind of the game. This uh, idiot who on CNN, what's his name? Um, Zakaria, right? Stuff like that. All these guys. So all these, all these people, all right? They come in and they're warm. They like wars. At no point in history did we have warmongers who were not warriors. Think about it. Hannibal, who was first in battle, he was first in battle. Even Napoleon was. More exposed than a regular soldier. And if you take the whole hierarchy of societies, I only found four societies in history who at some point had a hierarchy, right, where the warrior, the person who take more risk, was not on top. Okay? English society, based around the Lord concept, they still observe it. They made sure that one of those princes during the uh, uh, Argentine fake war, whatever, I mean, it's not a fake war, but it was like a, that kind of whatever you want to call it, all right? Uh, he was more exposed in his helicopter than other people, okay, on the ground. So why, you can't be a lord if you're not a lord. <laughs> That's the whole thing. So you take more risk than others, therefore you have privileges. And the societies where people start having prominence without having a physical risk were rare. The Roman Empire, Roman emperors, the Emperor Julian, he died on a uh, on uh, on the front in the on the on the Persian front, like a soldier, he was the emperor, with a uh, you know, and of course he didn't have a shield, unlike other soldiers, not because he was too lazy, but because he was an emperor, right? <laughs> he was bravado, and and of course uh, Valerian was captured by the and, and turned into a, uh, a stool, the emperor was used as a stool, and so you have so you have about two thirds of emperors died of violence in the Roman Empire, and a re third remaining, either, you know, had you waited longer, you know what would have happened, or and or, uh, they died in their bed 
more, many, many of them we think are poison. But that's the whole idea of skill in the game. Why do you need warmongers to be warriors? But let's think about the filtering mechanism. I'm, I, I, if you're on a highway, okay, it's very rare to see, say, someone with the stupidity of Thomas Friedman drive and cause 75 people to die. Why? These people are already dead, <laughs> you see. So you have a balance in society where warmongers are more exposed than others, okay? As the French say, qui vit de la guerre meurt de la guerre. All right. He who lives from the floor. Okay, and that that and that, that 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 balance that restores a balance, like we have a balance in driving. This is why India doesn't have that balance, and they have a much higher mortality rate on the road than we do here. Okay, so the uh, the the uh, the idea of, of you you, you own your own risk when you drive. Okay, you inflict risk on others. That's balance. That symmetry. That risk symmetry existed in America until George Bush, the father. He was, as you remember, okay, in war and captured and assume, or whatever, some like James Bond like adventures involved in it. And that was real. So that was the last generation. So but but this be the filtering is not just at the risk level, it's at the decision making level. So let me, you know, let's let's see how the mechanism works. A friend of mine who, like me as a trader, didn't know what to do with his life after you know leaving trading. Actually, you never really leave trading. But when you say I'm no longer a trader, then then people identify you you know differently. Okay, so the day when you decide that you're not officially a trader, but you're still a closet trader, you hide. Anyway, so he decided he left trading and decided he had the very very bad idea of becoming an investor in restaurants. Don't if you are so, and and he noticed one thing about that business, they have prizes. Prizes, you know, the, the best uh, sushi, uh, you know, the, the best uh, uh, sushi roll with without avocado, with avocado, the best vegan, whatever, the best thing in, in town, the best atmosphere. This okay, so they get all these awards, and there is a gala dinner, and where these awards are given at your end. He noticed that very few restaurants made it to the gala dinner. They were bankrupt before. Why is it so? Because you don't have a peer review mechanism in the restaurant business. It's not the restaurateur who will judge if another restaurant is sound. Who judges? The client. Right? That's the mechanism. And also another thing of scaling, name a restaurant that has real food and more than 400 tables, <laughs> okay, in any location, I mean, you can, okay, so this is, there is a scaling effect, anyway, so, the, so you notice the restaurant is judged by the clients, okay, not by a committee that decides, okay, but, so, the idea of skin in the game, it hit me that any business where people are judged by peers and not by reality, okay, reality, with, you know, have mortality from reality or something like that, are businesses that would eventually rot. This is why academia is rotting, because the peer review mechanism is causing them, like I know from finance, they, they know nothing, okay, practically nothing, okay. The, the matter is they, they don't miss, they, they, they don't get. And visibly, of course, you may have some input from your colleagues about whether you have talent or not, but ultimately it's a client. And it's a business. So, in other words, it's not Microsoft who decide whether Apple should survive, but the accountants or whatever. Okay, so you want to impress your accountant more than your peers. That's a plus. But that idea of peer judgment is at odds with my trader life, because as a trader, you know, the first thing I was told is, is if people like you, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> okay, I mean, it is mechanism. You cannot be. And, and, and this is why a lot of traders are libertarian, because you've got to use your own head to think. Because if you're a conformist, you're a me too person, you're going to arrive too late to the trade. You're going to be what we call the turkey, you know? The last passenger on the bus, right? Or something like that. So that was or on the wrong bus. Anyway, so, so we have a class of people who has been, have been determining and causing wars who really are not involved in these wars. So therefore, the incentive is, you know, 
to be right, and they cannot learn. So this is what it, it, I don't believe that humans learn intellectually. I believe you learn, but that's evolution 101. Those academics tell you there's no God, there's ever, there, there, of course, it's evolution, etc. but it doesn't apply to them <laughs> because the whole mechanism of evolution is selection through survival right, and reproduction. So the interventionistas did not learn from Vietnam. They did not learn from the Iraq war. They did not learn from Libya. Libya, look at Libya. I mean, they have slave markets in Libya. Okay? They did not learn. So there is something fundamentally wrong in the way they work because if there's no feedback, so like uh, uh, academics and economics, because there's no feedback. So I classify, so very simple. Have you heard of the expert problem? The expert problem, and people say there's right against experts. I say, no, it's very simple. That rule allows us to know who is the expert. Okay, a plumber is going to be an expert at plumbing. Okay, if you you know if a dentist, if you come back, you know if you return from a dentist visit, look at your teeth in the mirror and you still have them, but visibly the she or he knows something about dentistry. So they are businesses where you cannot, what I call it, you cannot micro bullshit, right? So you cannot, but you can micro bullshit because there's no skin in the game in these macro things. So you classify, 99% of the people in America are calibrated in the sense that they are not fooling anyone. They own their own risk. They take, you know, whether you drive your car or they collect an honest paycheck or an honest dollar, you know, if they're self-employed. That's 1% that call themselves elite. They are immune to any kind of reality. Judgment from reality. They don't have a PNL. I mean, we know in trading we had people with PNL and people without PNL, and we'd call them openly the bullshitters and the PNL people, right? I mean, that was in trading. I mean, it would be their face. In, in trading, of course, you can you can so long as you're making money, you're okay. We're going to fire you the minute you lose money, so you might as well be rude, you know, to them. So the uh, the bureaucrats of the firm. So and so now I spoke about societies that had non-war mongers, namely the bureaucrats, rise up to the top and determine you know, uh, policies and decide. The first one was ancient Egypt. The minute scribes took over ancient Egypt, it fell apart. The guys from up north or came down the Hyksos like the knife and uh, I mean, these guys couldn't figure out what was going on, right? They were so out of it, okay? That's the first time. Another time is China had a phenomenal growth in knowledge. It invented almost everything. It dominated intellectual life. Uh, it would have dominated if it was open borders, but we knew it had almost everything. Then they had the great idea to have Harvard, what I call Soviet Harvard, to have a Soviet Harvard, you know, the scholars of the Imperial Palace run the place. And they ran it to the ground. <laughs> the minute these people ran the place, boom. Innovation disappeared in China. <laughs> it was built organically, bottom up, and just like the English. I mean, they had the Industrial Revolution. I say English because it was in England, not UK. Industrial Revolution coming out of illiterate adventures, building the whole place, and then suddenly they say, "Oh yeah, no." Uh, and now they have committees at, at Cambridge, you know, a bunch of uh, empty suits we call them bureaucrats, trying to uh, you know uh, improve on the play. Of course, it was. <laughs> Ran over by Silicon Valley. So, the um, now, a few more things. If I have more time, you should stop me ten minutes before. Okay. I, I'm not a good speaker because I'm an author. I don't want to be a good speaker okay, because uh, you know that it's, there's something about, you know, it's too smooth. Okay, skin in the game. Is, is not, not, okay. So, don't want to be a talker. But, so, peace. I have a, ch a few chapters here about the extension of skin in the game with respect to peace, suppress, stuff like that. The first thing I have to say that this is the most insulting. I and mean, every page, if you're in the press, you get insulted. There's a chapter on IYI, intellectual yet idiot. Okay, All people you don't have, like 4 million from India, 4 million um, 
uh, uh, downloads, including pirated versions in 23 languages, right? Even you know, uh, and, and of course translated now in 37 languages. <laughs> okay, but the so when you're pirated, you know the idea is good. I mean, they don't steal nothing, all right? So, for, so the uh, the a lot of part of the intellectually at idiot because it seems to be a worldwide phenomenon of of people. Uh, you know, you recognize them. Okay, they're very good at taking grades, and it looked like the school system has been designed, all right, it's like a circular thing, is, is uh, you're, you're, uh, it, to make people very good at taking exams, all right, and then teaching people how to take exams. So that's, it's like a circular system. And the contact with reality, of course, after a while, is going to disappear, yet we're going to call these people very smart. Yeah, that 1%. And it's not everywhere. And I'm a professor of engineering, and engineering, there's very little IYI. But economics, there's nothing but that. Okay, uh, and then you end up sometimes even within a field. So I, I, I say hey, there's a bunch of people here: uh, Cass Sunstein and a guy called Richard Taylor. They wanted to manipulate citizens, and I showed in 12 point that these guys don't know the math that they're using. It's like math 101, but then they can get away with it. I call them intellectually yet idiot because they're not smart enough to understand the world. But the problem is, they're smart enough to be intellectual and take exams. And that, that little bit that's missing is what makes it or breaks it. So, and it attacked, of course, book reviewers because they don't have skin in the game. In other words, you can write a book, a review of a book you haven't read and nobody would know it was impunity. So I attacked these people and I made an embargo on my book in America. No reviewer can get it. You want it, you wait. It's going to be Barnes & Noble. You go spend $17.63 on discount or it. You get your book and you write whatever you want. Okay, thanks, bye. So they disappear. They look like they, they can't even spend the $20 on a book. So they, and then the book came out. So the publisher said, yeah, it's going to, you know, it's not going to sell, of course. It opened two on a bestseller list on, New York, on a New York Times. That New York Times that I'm attacking as a fraud, two on a bestseller list. <laughs> So, I say, you know, the New York Times reader, typical IYI, New Yorker reader. I switched from New York Times to New Yorker because New Yorker is like you read an article enough to be able to talk about something you don't understand. So you can understand the shallowness of it, in, in, you know, when you're from that discipline. So, <sighs> victory that something's going on, and let's continue the press. So, the, there was a chapter in, in here about peace, okay? Since the Congress of Vienna, people have the illusion that you do peace between states. Okay? That a bunch of people, well dressed, would go negotiate, and it worked. Okay? Congress of Vienna, those states are represented as a unit. But we know, a lot of libertarians here, and a lot left, you know. So that pieces between people and the states are there is a agency problem because he who or she who represents states may represent himself herself with cronies and friends okay and like tony blair represent you know trying to make a peace treaty you know it's there's something in it okay so i have a chapter on peace and blood versus you know peace with commerce peace and ink peace and blood and peace and commerce Peace in Oslo, the Oslo Accord with the Palestinians didn't work. It was done a bunch of intellectuals in, uh, in, in Oslo. How has peace established itself between multi-ethnic in history? Commerce, bottom up. Okay. So peace from the top doesn't work. It has not worked. You have peace done by organically, like take the and 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 think about it. The Palestinian and the Jews had a uh, the settlers pre-Israel they had a uh, deal in '46. Palestinian had they accepted in '46, they would have been a lot better off than they are today. But say no, no, in a sp so people without skin in the game, sitting in Saudi Arabia, you know, oil and lot of, and then air conditioning, and a lot of mango juice, or if I say no, fermented uh, yogurt juice or uh, yogurt drinks, right? Because you can't have alcohol. So, and then they said, no, don't, right? Why in the name of, what? Well, okay, in the name of, so these poor people want to live somewhere, right? 48, had the Palestinian accepted. I should let people, it's not a bottom up, it all came from the top by people who were away, sitting invariably near a fridge, was very, very, very cold, 
in hot weather needed uh, uh, fermented yogurt, okay, diluted fermented yogurt, all right, when these people was, were, 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 you know, homeless, okay, or living in camps, you know, up, up in, the, in the heat. So, continued, so you cannot have peace, like the peace between Egypt and Israel. It's a peace done at the top. The populations don't trade with one another. It's not working. It's not going to be working in the long run. If you go to Egypt, there were uh, there were a lot more Jews before the peace in Egypt than there are today. And uh, really, and, and there's n nothing more anti-Semitic than the Egyptian population today. I mean, uh, the, except for the cops. Or even then, the cops, they, they, they keep their mouths closed because they want to stay out of trouble. So you cannot have, you have peace is bottom-up process done through commerce between units that are small enough to decide what they want for themselves. And within that, but the problem is all these institutions, UN, all things, they want to be employed. So they create agendas and then they have Tony Blair negotiating with some uh, other person from Oslo. So they're not, it doesn't work that way. So this is skin in the game. Continuing, there has something in this book called the Lindy Effect, named after a restaurant in New York. And I recommended the reader to study the rule, but not to go to that restaurant. <laughs> and the restaurant actually went it closed the week when the book was published. Okay, it was inedible. It's called the Lindy Effect. I mean, the restaurant was called Lindy. And uh, people used to meet, uh, the actors used to meet there. And discovered the rule that a play that had been going on, I mean, been going running for a hundred days, had a hundred more days to go. Three hundred days, three hundred more days to go. So life expectancy of plays increased with time. That's Lindy. There are a lot of things that are Lindy. The books in print, a book we've been reading the Bible now for a couple of thousand years. I mean, depend which one. All right, the New Testament for a couple of thousand years. Uh, and, and stuff like that. So the uh, the so that, that Lindy, something that is Lindy, tells you there are some patterns, okay, that we revert to. We go back to that pattern. Okay. And and and, and uh, uh, what is the naturalistic way for the news to be circulated? Well it turned out that we had the press, you know, in London, there was press and coffee shops coming out of coffee shops, but usually it was a tool to destroy the state or to attack the state, okay? But this idea of propaganda to sit down and receive information in a family with 2.2 .2 members, right? I don't know in Washington, uh, no, no, sorry, a, a father, mother, and 2.2 .2 children, but I don't know how many dogs, because I don't know the dogs or cat proportion, but 0. 0.6 dogs, and. Or point two of a cat or something. I don't know the the preferences here. So so you have that family watching, getting that monoculture, watching, receiving this uh, the the or reading something or something even more stupid, getting the New York Times. Okay, so that 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 phase in history has been very 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 brief. It ended with Donald Trump using Twitter. Okay, how did we have the news before? Well, you go to the barber shop, you bring your news, and you take news. Okay, you go to the market, you buy fish. Fishmonger will be rumor monger. Okay, you go to funerals or wakes, you get the news. So news were circulated organically when at no time in history a human could receive the news without being a transmitter. So you had skin the game in what you were conveying. Okay. And of course, post-war with the television and stuff like that, that was interrupted. And now with Twitter, we're making it back. And even Twitter bans, there's so much desire for people to convey information while, while receiving some for markets for information because that was part of any market. You buy goods and you buy information, you see. So this is why they can't control. Now we can't control it anymore. We're back to an environment, and and censorship never worked before. A little bit in Imperial Russia on some books, okay, but you, you cannot censor uh, a conversation. You can't.
Okay, if people sit down, as a matter of fact, the more you try to censor, the, 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 the more the news spread. So we're back in that environment. So I'm not worried about the media, and we're seeing the destruction of the media, and I give you an example of my book, and I've seen other books as well. You're only ignored by the media, uh, uh, you can still do very well. So, and, and the Lindy for the news is basically, you know, go back to forums like Twitter or the post Twitter, because maybe Twitter will try to go just, you know, uh, destroy its own reputation by not being a good broker, then you change broker. I mean, the exchange has died. You know, we had exchange marketplaces like the, the, the option exchanges that disappeared. They were replaced by other exchanges, like the London Stock Exchange was replaced. Amsterdam replaced by London, London replaced by New York Stock Exchange at the beginning of the century, last century. So, and another problem with the news is, uh, and I see it in the story of Ron Paul, is and I wrote a chapter on a charity, and, and how do you represent the news? The, the problem of taking something out of context. I'm a statistician, and the thing we hunt for is, we say the, the, the just like you say that the, News, uh, what do you say, the facts are right, the news is fake. You can have fake news with the right facts, if you hire central facts, okay? Uh, or you can take a sentence, okay, and then out of context, you know, make it look uh, uh, incriminating to anyone. Um, the same way you, you can with, with the news, that you have to represent the total reality, without, and, and that's called the principle of charity. And you observe it with, you know, a lot of, um, great uh, thinkers, those who survive. They represent, like Karl Popper, very faithfully the position of the opponent, often better than the opponent. And then they destroy it in two lines, <laughs> you see? So, so, but the selection, oh, he said this. He said this is meaningless. Is You have to say he meant that this. What you said is irrelevant. You said, what did you mean? That's principle of charity. And that has disappeared. Now, you could probably play that and destroy a couple of people. Can't do it forever, you see. Like for example, he made a comment. Uh, he made he made this racist comment. It's irrelevant. Does he have racist views? Yes or no? Is the racist uh, view part of his program? Yes or no? A lot of people can make no racist comments yet have a racist program, and a lot of people have non-racist pro program comments that may be perceived as racist. Okay. So this is where the principle of charity, which is a very strong principle. And in uh, intellectual communication, once you break it, you've destroyed your own uh, trade. Because at some point, you've got to remember, some people now like the New York Times because it's attacking Trump. But at some point, they're going to realize it could be doing the same thing to them on a position that's not in agreement with that in the New York Times. And then they will suffer. So finally, and something very positive aside from the news, in this book, I discuss the minority rule. And it's quite a big deal for uh, Ron, uh, for Dr. Paul, uh, because uh, minorities have made history, no, never majorities. And, and let me explain how it came to me. I discovered it. I was in at a, I discovered this asymmetry. I was uh, organizing a uh, a uh, cocktail at party, and at the and at a complexity you know festival and a. Um, and people came from Jerusalem, and I felt embarrassed that I had no kosher drinks for them. But they told me, no, all the drinks here are kosher. What? Yeah, look at the bottles. What? You, you... I said, yeah. Why? Because Coca-Cola doesn't want to bother <laughs> having kosher drinks, non-kosher drinks. They made everything kosher. Okay. So point, how many people are kosher in America? 0.2%. Yeah, yet almost all soft drinks are kosher, yes with a sign underneath, or on a need-to-know basis, okay? So you realize that you have minority rules, you know, playing a role in things. So I start thinking, same thing with the, with the, with the lamb. If you got, uh, for Christmas, I opened the lamb thing, uh, package, and it was halal. But, you know, you need to know what halal is to know it's halal. But why is it? <laughs> what are you going to do, have merchandising of, Halal meat here, here a different truck, different thing, different. You get mixed up, you get lawsuit. No, you make it all halal, okay? So think about it. Then how minority rule, ethics follow minority rule, okay? And the formation of ethics and there's evidence through the way it's done. It's not because the majority decide that theft is bad. I'm intolerant. I only eat non-stolen merchandise. 
but my friend the thief okay can eat both we'll go to a restaurant we're gonna go eat using my preferences typically at a table if one person is organic and all the other ones except GMOs you're gonna have organic <laughs> just like when, in peanuts on a plane if one person is allergic to peanuts on a plane the whole plane is peanut free okay now of course this plays some vicious roles and you know uh, yeah, so, so sometimes you have distortions, but in general, it can lead to good things. Okay, I am intolerant of journalists. I'm intolerant of journalists. That's it. I cannot. No, the New York Times doesn't exist for me. Why? Because I'm intolerant. This is my religion. The religion is no New York Times citation in my class. It doesn't exist. All right. So this is how movements develop <laughs> to take. Because if you're right and happen to be intolerant, and you have an ethical standard you abide by. And say there's violations of ethics that have been committed by this by CNN. The violations of ethics have been committed here, and if you're impartial enough to have to apply that rule across the board, then it works. And effectively, it has worked for me. I'm totally I mean, I get insulted. Say they call me it's arrogant. I explain to them, arrogant has no epistemological signification. You have to be more precise. Okay. And then they tell me you're narcissistic. I tell them, then again, I mean, it's like the pathologization using some kind of, they take the DSM and open it randomly and find the mental disease you have because you don't agree with, with them. So aside from that, but okay, but it's, it may work with some people, it didn't work with me. I'm too stubborn. I am, so this is so, so after a while, they yield. Like I've applied it to academia where there are a lot of people use papers, non papers. So this is where I think that the libertarian movement, can do very well. There's one comment here I'm making uh, about libertarian movement that the reason it doesn't do, didn't do well in history was for the following reason. <laughs> the em Emperor Julian, the same one who died, you know, who had skin in the game, uh, wanted to revert to paganism from Christianity. And paganism was disorganized, but it's a freedom, you know, you have your gods, you share gods, you're very tolerant of other people's gods. But, you know, and, and Christianity replaced that. So Julian, it was called Julian the Apostate, wanted to revert, wanted to have a clergy, a unified clergy for paganism. Right? Of course it failed, because by definition, you cannot have a party like a church of paganism. It's the same thing. You're creating the same thing with different gods. It doesn't work. We already have that. We already have that Christianity has absorbed other gods anyway. They did the job for you. He didn't get it. Likewise, libertarianism didn't survive, didn't, didn't do very well as a big party because it was fragmented among other parties. <laughs> because there's no unified, we're going to have a libertarian unified policy with respect to this. But we, by definition, libertarian wants to be free to think using her or his head. Okay, So this is why it didn't work. Nevertheless, there are common you know, things that libertarians believe. And all you need to do is be more intolerant. That's it. <laughs> be intolerant. Thank you for listening to me.